we are going to engage in um, a conversation between two uh, people who um, have their own life experience, uh, their own academic experience, a professional experience, um, engaged in public policy matters. Um, uh, and Dr. Ntandi and uh, Mr. Joe Rothstein. They are going to, uh, I'm gonna ask them about their backgrounds uh, in a way in which uh, we can get to know them. But we're gonna have two approaches to this understanding of our world today. Uh, it's history, which both of them are historians and to look at um, how we can look at the factual piece and the fictional piece. We're gonna look at the role of the arts in understanding these, uh, these matters, these, uh, the, the, you know, how the intersection of the geopolitical thing that we talk about with nuclear weapons and how broad they are, but if we talk about nuclear weapons as one of the weapons of mass destruction, we also have to talk about it in the context of weapons of individual destruction, small arms, and all the implications there too. So with that, um, Dr. Vincent Ntandi and uh, Mr. Joe Rothstein, uh, I'm gonna sit a bit away from you so that the spotlight will be on the both of you, but um, uh, Joseph, if you will, um, just, who are you and why are you here? <clears throat> I'm here because uh, 50 years ago I worked uh, in the United States Senate for a, a um, senator by the name of Mike Gravel from Alaska. And um, uh, Mike Gravel uh, was considered uh, a maverick at the time and um, he died a couple of years ago and the, the obituaries weren't all that kind to him, you know, because he wasn't sort of one of the club. Uh, but, you know, you judge people by their performance and uh, in the 12 years that uh, he was a senator, uh, he was instrumental in getting the best land claims uh, package settlement uh, ever uh, produced out of the government for the, the native people in Alaska. Um, he uh, was successful <clears throat> in getting satellite uh, transmission for all the uh, villages in Alaska which didn't have landlines. He read the Pentagon Papers on the floor of the U.S. Senate at a time when um, uh, no other senator would. And in fact, um, later the uh, papers were published by a Quaker publishing house in Boston. And you see a lot of uh, literature out on about the Pentagon Papers these days, but that's, to my knowledge, the only place you would find the actual papers from beginning to end. And he, um, he filibustered until the uh, Senate agreed to abolish the draft. He also uh, was important to the nuclear uh, disarmament uh, cause, and that's one of the reasons I'm here. So I was his chief of staff at the time, and uh, so we worked on all these things pretty much together. <clears throat> but I just want to point out two things about my... Uh, one, it's important to be a maverick. <laughs> uh, and I'll get to the second in a minute, so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> now I want to um, draw a picture for you. Uh, it was uh, November 6, 1971, in front of the Supreme Court. Thousands of people gathered. Uh, all the world's media was focused on what was happening inside. And what was happening inside was uh, the court was trying to determine whether to stop 
um, a five megaton blast that was scheduled to go off an hour and a half later in Amchitka, Alaska, one of the uh, Alaska Aleutian Islands. <clears throat> and for drama, you, you can hardly imagine uh, uh, a more vivid scene. Here was the court meeting, the bomb was in the hole. Um, Japan, Canada, and most countries of the world were protesting, uh, you know, about the dangers of it. Um, it was the focus of the world's media. And on a four to three decision, uh, the Supreme Court allowed the uh, test to go ahead. I'm reading here because 50 years ago, my mind's a little, uh, uh, you know, I need a little help here. Um, <clears throat> the bomb was in a hole that they dug a mile deep, if you can imagine. And when it went off, uh, the earth raised 20 feet. That was uh, the force of the explosion. Uh, it did uh, create the earthquakes that everybody worried about. It didn't create the tidal waves, but it did something uh, very important, which I'll also get to in a minute. <clears throat> this was uh, the culmination. This didn't happen by accident, this worldwide protest. This was the culmination of a plan that began about a year earlier. This was Alaska, and so Senator Gravel was, you know, uh, deeply involved in it. Uh, there was a lot of um, uh, uncertainty among the environmental and any nuclear groups about whether or not to take uh, trying to stop the bomb as a project. Uh, on whether uh, there were also um, uh, nuclear test ban talks going on in Geneva and, and uh, there was a, a strong feeling among a number of groups that the focus should be on the bans, not on the test. <clears throat> Nevertheless, uh, uh, enough groups were concerned, so uh, we gathered them, and we were certainly concerned, and we gathered them together uh, uh, for a meeting and uh, came away with uh, a three-part plan. One of them is that Senator Gravel would introduce uh, 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 legislation to stop the test and our office would be a focal point for trying to gather media and so on. Um, the second focal point would be um, uh, litigation and uh, a group uh, we called um, the Committee for Nuclear Responsibility was organized uh, to file litigation to stop the test. And then, uh, of course, there was street action that, you know, had to uh, rile up the world over this uh, test. And so, um, hardly anybody uh, knew about it, or if they did, were, they were, weren't concerned because there had been some earlier minor tests at Amchitka Island. And so, it wasn't that easy to get people to, uh, to pay attention. But uh, Senator Gravel got the uh, legislation uh, assigned to his committee. We... Um, uh, scheduled hearings in Alaska. Um, we had contacts with the Alaska media, so uh, I, uh, before I went to came to Washington, I was editor of the Anchorage Daily News, so I had a lot of friends at the newspaper. <clears throat> and we had the newspaper contact the Associated Press and say we'd like uh, full coverage of the hearings, and, and um, because they were a client, and, uh, major client, you know, the, the AP had had uh, a reporter there. We also uh, were friends with the people at the TV stations. We had the NBC um, uh, affiliate in Anchorage ask uh, NBC News to, for national coverage on it, or at least regional coverage. 
<clears throat> and um, and so they finally complied. And when that happened, then we told CBS and ABC and uh, all the others uh, they'd be there. So we pretty much ensured that we were going to get pretty good. And then we made sure that the hearing in Alaska was pretty explosive. I mean, whatever you your mind can imagine about, this was an earthquake zone, and in 1964, South Central Alaska had had the largest earthquake uh, in history, really, 9.4, and killed 150 people and devastated the whole South Central um, part of Alaska. Um, and so everybody was pretty sensitive to the fact that this was an earthquake zone. We, um, so we uh, managed to get press, that kicked it off. Uh, all of the organizing groups uh, co made contact with their press people. Uh, all of them organized street action, but they weren't doing it alone. They were doing it now under the umbrella of uh, a story that people had heard about. And, um, and so, <clears throat> Uh, over the next uh, months, the, uh, there were hundreds of thousands of people in the streets in Canada and uh, the U.S. and uh, all the normal action you would take if you're trying to create protests. Um, also, not to be uh, ignored, is Greenpeace. There was a boat called Greenpeace. Actually, it was a charter, the Canadians chartered a, a herring boat named, and uh, renamed it Greenpeace and, uh, and was planning to, to anchor three miles off the coast, which would have been a problem for the test. But the, the test was postponed, and probably because they wanted to get rid of the boat. And so, uh, it, it, anyway, it was the, uh, origin of the Greenpeace movement. Um, all of this, of course, led to the legal challenge, the final street action, and uh, anybody who wants to look at them, I brought some uh, newspapers from the day, from large towns, small towns, uh, you know, all the countries in the world protesting and so on. So, I mean, it was a remarkable event. So the uh, two points I want to make is, um, one of them, it's important not only to have an advocate, but to have a maverick advocate in, in uh, Senator Gravel. I mean, what, whatever action, if it's important enough, it's important enough to enlist somebody who really can, can be the focal point. And secondly, uh, it requires uh, a united effort. It, it requires not just the people in the street. It mean it, you need the people in the courtroom, you need the people in the media, and you need a way to organize it all into a campaign. Uh, uh, you know that culminates at a specific date and time, which is also important because that adds the pressure. So that's. The other reason I'm here is that I've just written a book called The Moment of Menace, in which I've taken the lessons from this and, uh, and put it in the uh, plan of a woman U.S. president who's uh, on a mission to get a worldwide nuclear test ban treaty. And, and I brought some of those books today. So. Rothstein's both experience and his mentation ideation into context around this movement, his experience around the media uh, and around legislation. So we, we want to listen to him going forward. Please. Uh, Joe, uh, Dr. Vincent Antani is, is well known also uh, as, a, as a scholar and activist. Uh, his is a very uh, unique approach to understanding both the complex of civil rights, human rights, nuclear weapons abolition, and organizing. So Dr. Ntandi, why might you be here today?
Thank you. Um, first, thank you, Joe, for all your work. Um, the world is better with you in it, and I uh, really thank you. Um, so why am I here today? Well, the simple answer is when you have somebody as amazing as Mel Hardy and he calls you to be somewhere, you go. So whenever Mel calls, I go. Throw in the golden rule and there's no question where I'd rather be on a Sunday. Um, so, because I, I, I'm grateful and, and honored that I get to participate with the Golden Rule on uh, May 1st in Baltimore. I had the opportunity to research the Golden Rule for my first book and look at how the actions around it motivated people like Bayard Rustin uh, to then go and uh, work with in Ghana and work with Nkrumah on issues of nuclear disarmament. Um, but how I got here... Uh, and why am I here is most of my work as an academic and an activist growing up uh, revolved around the black freedom movement. Um, like a lot of young kids, nuclear weapons really wasn't on my radar. I thought nobody would be crazy enough to use them. It was very abstract. I was working on more immediate issues. Um, that changed the first time I went to Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 2005. Um, meeting with Coco Kondo, who we talked about briefly earlier, um, going to the ceremonies, and uh, there was, if you uh, ever go, if you've ever been there on August 6th, uh, the day of the atomic bombing, so there's the ceremony in the morning, and then at night there's the lantern ceremony at the T Bridge, which was the which the Enola Gay looked at for the aerial shot to, to, to drop it, and there's, you know, thousands of people there and there's music playing and people are making their own floating lanterns and putting them in the water. And I remember um, in 2005 and I was with Japanese students um, and, and American students and we were going through the line writing our messages on the lanterns and putting those in and I just completely lost it. I was just sobbing and apologizing and um, Coco actually came down and kind of consoled me. and. I've gone back to Hiroshima and Nagasaki pretty much every year um, since then till about 2013. And every year I'd get there and be like, okay, I'm, I'm good now. And sure enough, when I get to the lantern ceremony, I'd fall apart all over again. Like it's just always gonna be something for me. So when I came back from that first trip, I said, okay, how do I combine these two passions of mine, eliminating nuclear weapons and eliminating racism? And I just started with asking the question, what did African Americans think about dropping the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? And that started all of my research and all of my work focusing on the intersection of race and nuclear weapons, which I don't think you can separate. Um, and that's kind of where how I ended up in this field and with all this work and, and how I ended up here today. So I'd much rather stop there so we can have much more time for discussions and questions. So thank you. So um, what I'd like to do is just tease out um, this matter. We're, we're going to look at the Hiroshima children's drawings later. We're going to look at art. documenting the role of the arts in this matter that engages all of us? Well, um, I think there's no end to the people who are affiliated with the arts, who, uh, who believe in this cause and who've worked on it. Um, what's surprising to me is that there's, uh, you know, this treaty at the UN uh, now to abolish nuclear weapons that 100 um, countries have signed. Of course, none of them have nuclear weapons, but, uh, but um, it seems to me just thinking as a, I spent 30 years running political campaigns for uh, good guys, hopefully, you know, uh, for, the, for, for the Congress and the state office and so on. But when you want to get something done, you really need a, you need a plan, you need the research, you need the information, and you need to figure out where, where your assets are. I think there's a lot of assets lying around there that, uh, that haven't been mobilized. Um, you know, if you had a vote, uh, how many people would like to abolish nu nuclear weapons, you know, the vote would be 
90, 10, 99 to 1, who knows? Same with abolished war, you know. But, um, but uh, it's one thing, you know, it's, you have uh, also, uh, you know, pretty much uh, the same thing with uh, gun safety. But you really need a campaign. I mean, uh, I come from the campaign world, and and campaigns are being run all the time to sell soap and other things. And you know, it's no accident, you know, that they're successful. They've got money behind them. They've got uh, they've got uh, influencers behind them, and uh, and uh, you know, the most bizarre things become popular. You know, it doesn't happen by accident. You know. Thank you. Um, I can't stress enough how important art is into this movement or any social movement for that matter. Uh, in, the, in the new book, I, I do focus on the art world because it was interviewing and looking at people like um, Bread for Puppets Theater Company and the role that they played in the June 12, 1982 rally. They were so incredibly important. Or looking even at the official poster uh, of the June 12th rally that has the dove and the five legs coming out. When I interviewed the artist that made it, you know, if you look at it, he specifically had the, the legs having different clothes on and different shoes and different uh, uh, colors of their legs and he did that to show the intersectionality to show how diverse this movement was and how it affects everybody uh, looking at dancers for disarmament or performing artists for nuclear disarmament you know when you look at the, the role of Broadway in in the nuclear disarmament movement through the 80s they were so influential putting in nuclear disarmament issues and information in the playbills to educate even people just going to see them uh, when we look at how money was raised through people like concerts and music and how influential that was, or even that day having people like Gil Scott Huron or Sweet Honey and the Rock and Bruce Springsteen and James Taylor and Shaka Khan, I can go on and on of how many people were, you know, dedicated their artistic ability to this. Uh, even when you look back at like Lorraine Hansberry, you know, uh, the last play that she ever wrote was about a nuclear holocaust and what happens to the survivors. So the role of art is so important, whether it's through writing, painting, you know, and even today to, to kind of piggyback on what we were just listening to um, from Hawaii and the scare that they had of those 38 minutes of, you know, this is not a drill. Well, you look at what Games for Change has done. Games for Change now has the VR experience on the morning you wake in which when you put that oculus on you're there now you are in Hawaii for that entire time and living through it and it is absolutely brilliant because it has gotten I've, I've brought it to my school and it has gotten students who normally maybe won't read a tomb of a book to now look at the VR experience which is art they're creating it through graphic design through their ability of you know using video to actually now engage a whole new generation so it's really important when we're talking with students especially or younger folks that that have artistic ability, that they can then use that art in the same way artists used it through the black arts movement, through the Harlem Renaissance, that they can use that um, for this issue or for any issue that they're truly passionate about. But you certainly wouldn't have a nuclear disarmament movement without the world of art. Um, and again, you can pretty much say that for, for uh, most, if not all social movements. So I can't stress it enough. Thank you so much. So um, we've listened to the, the role of the arts, we've listened to the privacy of the campaign. So that uh, thought leadership, uh, the, the, the strategizing, along with our organizing, I think uh, this new language about uh, how we do campaigns, we can you know, use the benefit of your experience. How many, I mean, what questions might we have of these two brilliant uh, people here? So, yes? So I, I have a comment, and uh, David is here, uh, David Barrows, was an instrumental part of this. So I'm John Steinbach, the Michigan Architect of Peace Committee. So I'd just like to, you guys to talk about also the, the you, you talked about bread and puppets, uh, that it, and, that, and that's really important, and there were a lot of groups like that. But there were also groups like the Grey Panthers and Women's Strike for Peace, and we did a, a lot of really good creative street theater type stuff. I remember one of the things we did was uh, when Reagan when decided that he came out with this program that uh, that after after World War III that the elders would be sent out to eat the food, test the food because they have less to lose in terms of life expectancy. And uh, you know the, the Great Panthers and Archie Papa Johnny came out with a big press release 
talking about all nuclear waste slaves. And like 600 newspapers picked that up all over the place and it just made a mockery of what Reagan was doing. And then in 83, David played, played a really central role in organizing the Dining for Peace in support of the Refuse the Cruise uh, missiles in Europe. And we had a die-in, and David brought uh, some cooked sausages, and the Paul uh, Pat, the Peace Walker, uh, ate them, and we had Bobby Rhodes, and he was the Grim Reaper, and we had 500 people there. So, no, the, so, so, so that's not exactly art, but it kind of relates to that. So I just wanted to throw that out there. That's art. I just want to say, Code Pink uh, did a die-in once. We actually enacted, I mean, they enacted a wedding. We were on this wedding party, and it was right at the White House. And some people are make, some guy was going off as usual. We had to pay him $100 to get him to be quiet. Anyway, we enacted a wedding, and then suddenly, there the drones, drones are coming. And everybody, uh, you know, there was a bride, and, uh, you know, the best man, and all that kind of thing. So we all hit the floor was in front of all these tourists. And of course, tourist season, the prime time is cherry blossom time in the summer. And if you really want to get a message out, you do live theater in front of where you know a huge crowd is going to be. Even at the Capitol right now, you've got big tour groups, especially of young people and students. And they're really curious. And and um, Helen and I were out there for, for um, uh, you know, Witness against torture in orange jumpsuits and black hoods. And the kids were asking some of the kids were asking questions. Yeah, if I can just for a second, you know, I think one of the biggest things that we need to really work on is um, especially in education, what we're doing is the schools are so, they're siloing STEM and humanities. So if you are a kid who is taking science and engineering, you are not studying philosophy, art, creative writing, history, and vice versa. They're forcing you to pick majors, forcing you to just go in and out. So imagine then if you are taking a, a physics class, but then you're also an art major, right? And you would start to see how those things interact and we're not doing that. We have figured out ways to take issues like the slave trade or the middle passage and create children's books and know how to educate them, but we haven't done that with nuclear disarmament, and why haven't we done that, right? So there's those types of things where we got to be do a better job of showing students that they can use their art, right, for these issues and how they can do that, and that's something that's dramatically needs to change in the education system. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of room that we can, you know, that we need to do. Um, and things like, you know, we we have the Oppenheimer movie coming out in July. That is going to be a blockbuster. That's Christopher Nolan. That's a ton of celebrities. So not only should we be using that film when it comes out nationwide as a springboard um, to have larger discussions in the media <clears throat> excuse me, about nuclear weapons, but we can also use it to show, again, the ability of art and movie making and how it can be used, again, to further the cause of nuclear disarmament. Yeah, one of the problems is it's too easy for uh, bad stuff to get normalized. You know, you know people... Uh, except the fact that, oh well, nuclear weapons, you know, who cares, you know, it's been this uh, way for now, what, 70 years, the world hasn't been blown up, you know, so uh, I guess we're all right. And it takes something like uh, Putin saying, uh, I think we're, we may use them in Ukraine to refocus attention and at times like that are the times that you want to grab onto it and run with it because now uh, now it's not just part of the wallpaper anymore. You know. That's fantastic. Well, with this, um, we have looked at. Um, I'm, I'm just fixated on the privacy of campaigning, also uh, in, in the way of organizing. So we'll. we'll what we have next is uh, we have Colleen Moore to kind of help us look through a uh, feminist activist lens on the uh, nuclear weapons issue. And so, Colleen, please allow us to join you. Join you.
Perfect. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I am Colleen Moore. I am currently the advocacy director at Women Cross DMZ. So the organization is the leading feminist voice in the movement for peace in Korea. And I previously worked at an organization, Global Zero, which advocates for the global abolition of nuclear weapons. And that's how I got connected with everyone here at All Souls. I know I got connected with John and Mel a few years ago and I was still at Global Zero. Um, so when I was working on more of the domestic of calling more for U.S. nuclear disarmament, um, and as everyone has talked about so far, I mean, it was really hard to break through and advocate for abolition and for the U.S. to do pretty much anything on cutting the Pentagon budget and um, nuclear weapons budget specifically. But I think I, I've definitely seen that get a lot harder after the Russian invasion of Ukraine last year. And I think a lot of what we have talked about so far today about intersectionality and how to connect it to so many of these other movements, I think that is starting to break through a little bit more. I think, you know, the U.S. political culture is is really tough in the U.S. Um, with the division and with it seems like so many crises every day. But I, I think it's not only the morally correct thing to do, as, as Dr. Ntondi and, and so many others talked about, of connecting it to the facts of the U.S. nuclear history. But I think it's also a very strategic way to connect to a lot of these other movements of racial injustice, of the environmental concerns of nuclear weapons. Um, and I know that Helen talked a little bit about um, how it affects women and how it is a feminist issue. And so that's why I can talk a little bit more about um, in my current work. And I think that you know, what I, I want to focus on mostly is what can we do? Because as activists, we do have the agency to change, to change this culture around U.S. militarism. And I think sometimes when we talk about nuclear weapons, it's this huge thing that, you know, everyday people are like, I, I don't know how to change that. How am I supposed to change what's happening on the other side of the world? And I think that is really our jobs as activists to make it... Um, and to, to connect it to our everyday struggles and to make it real and to not shut down people's agency because we do truly have the agency to make change. So currently at Women Cross DMZ, um, so well before my time at Women Cross DMZ, we got our start by leading a crossing of prominent international women peace activists from North Korea to South Korea, calling for um, reunification of divided families for and for peace. Um, because right now we are still technically in a war with North Korea. The Korean War never formally ended. And it's been 70 plus years of war. And we really see that as the root cause of the nuclear crisis that we're seeing on the Korean Peninsula. Um, you know, North Korea is our enemy state, technically, and it's really ingrained a sense of distrust and it, neither side will lower their weapons first since we've been in this tit for tat escalation for literally more than 70 years. So we, I mean, we need to look at ourselves here in the U.S. of how we are ingraining that situation and escalating it even more so. Um, and Women Cross DMZ is a part of a larger coalition, the uh, Feminist Peace Initiative, with two other organizations, MADRE, which is a women's rights uh, global organization, and uh, Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. It's a membership organization of uh, many different grassroots groups around the US, and we're really seeking to reorient US foreign policy away from militarism and endless wars, and um, toward reinvesting these resources into life-affirming services. It's, um, you know, pretty wild that we are told that there is not enough money for universal health care and for universal education while we're sinking billions and billions of dollars into the military budget that is not making us safe at home. Um, and so we're really seeking to do this by truly democratizing foreign policy. And I think that's what Women Cross DMZ, and we have a grassroots uh, peace uh, uh, movement, the Korea Peace Now Grassroots Network. I know L 
and is a very involved member in our network, and it's really good to see you here. Um, and that's that's what I really see the um, this network as doing is truly democratizing policy. We bring frontline communities to talk with their representatives, and uh, that's primarily what I do is, is the congressional affairs for Women Cross DMZ, and um, really getting those stories directly to policymakers because they don't hear these stories as much as they should, and I, I think that it does really move them to hear stories, and it's not always about the ins and outs of whatever bill we're advocating for, but we are bringing, you know, survivors of the Korean War, we are bringing family members, we are bringing members of divided families to their representatives advocating for these bills of a peace agreement with North Korea, of reunification of divided families, um, ending the travel ban to North Korea. Right now, Americans cannot travel to North Korea, and that has really put a damper on a lot of the peace activism that we're trying to do, is bring North Koreans and Americans together to um, for that people-to-people -people engagement, because that's really how we see peace come about. Um, so I want to end this by talking a little bit more about what you can do. Uh, I talked about agency a little bit, and there are things that all of us can do. So uh, coming up this June and July, we have a lot going on. So in July marks the 70th anniversary of the signing of the Armistice Agreement that ended hostilities of the Korean War, but never actually ended the war. It was always meant to be replaced with a peace agreement. So that's coming up in July 20, on July 27th. So we're doing this mass mobilization here in DC, starting off at the Capitol the morning of July 27th, uh, ending with a rally at the White House. We're hoping to have hundreds and hundreds of people um, doing some advocacy meetings as well uh, earlier in the week. And before that, in June, June 5th through 9th, uh, we have our virtual advocacy days. So we're doing it virtually because we've found that it's a little bit more accessible and people don't have to travel all the way to DC to meet with their representatives and senators. And we'll be advocating for a few of these pieces of legislation uh, that I have been talking about. So we mostly work on the Peace on the Korean Peninsula Act, which advocates for a peace agreement with North Korea and so you can sign up for that uh, definitely talk to me afterwards if you want to sign up for any of that come to DC in July um, and I yeah I just thank everyone uh, for speaking today about how we can achieve nuclear abolition and I think that talking a lot about these flashpoints are really important and you know I, I touched on North Korea but I also just briefly wanted to mention this great power competition with US and China I think is going to guide US militaristic policy for decades to come unfortunately and that's really what uh, we are trying to do at Women Cross DMZ and the Feminist Peace Initiative is put together a feminist counter to this great power competition. Um, you know, I, I think that North Korea's nuclear weapons are dangerous, of course. I think that the potential for clashes between the US and China and South China Sea or China Taiwan is it's really scary. But what the US is doing is not trying to prevent that. Our militaristic policies and sinking more and more money into the Pentagon budget is not what's going to prevent that. It's engagement, it's diplomacy, it's elevating the voices of the people that would be affected by a military confrontation. So that's what we're really trying to do is elevate those voices in the Asia, in the Asia Pacific um, and bring them together to discuss what a feminist counter to this great power competition could be. Um, so yeah, I'll end there and, and definitely let me know if you're interested in getting more involved. We have a lot coming up, like I said, and yeah, I'm happy to, to talk about it. Yeah, thanks so much.